Uh, it's, it's my pleasure to be here. In fact, it's a, it is an honor for sure to be here. And uh, I'll thank Helen and Gary for stepping in uh, at the last minute because uh, my drummer is on an alpha weekend. But I particularly want to thank this, the lovely blonde up here, in case you don't know, that's Nikki, and it's Karen Cruz's uh, daughter, because Karen broke her ankle at, at one of our music practices. Now, it, it does get rough, but that's, <laughs> that, that's about as bad as it's, as it's been, actually. Um, so she did. You know, what can I say? Uh, but uh, so she covered very well, and I uh, appreciate that. And, and yes, I, I sometimes say to people, I'm a bit of a worship bigot. If you were to say to me, Robin, what, can you present the gospel in terms of worship? I could do it, really. And, and it's not a, a boast. It's just something that God put on my heart a long time ago. And uh, it's, it's still there. And so I hope that this is encouraging uh, and worth listening to. Um, it's a story from the Old Testament. Now, I don't know about you, um, if you're young in the faith or long in the faith, but I'm here to encourage those of you that you know, are, are trying to work your way through the Bible and study it, etc., and you look at the size of the Old Testament, and you think, my goodness, that's going to take some time. And then you read some of the stories, and frankly, they're a bit mad sometimes <laughs> and hard to understand. And I also, I brought this because we've all got iPhones and smartphones and dumb phones and all sorts of stuff these days. Uh, and, you know, you look at your Bibles in there, and you think, well, that's not bad. It's really tiny. Look, there's the real thing there. Look at that. <laughs> you know, how's anybody going to get through that? And, and I am the worst studier. My wife, who's here, Jacqueline, is great. She uses one of those wee plans. You know the wee plan, a chapter a day, etc. and you read the Bible, and sticks to it. It's really sickening, actually. But I just like to start and work through. And I've managed to get through it about six times. Actually, that's a boast, all right? But most of the time, it gets so far, and then I forget where I was, or, you know, I'm too tired one night. And, uh... But sometimes I get stuck at a passage that just won't let me go. And I keep coming back to it, and coming back to it, and I keep thinking, what on earth is it about that passage that's got me going? And I, that usually means, in case you've ever been there, it usually means that, that God's Holy Spirit is trying to tell you something. And this is one of them. It's in Second Chronicles, and it's in chapter 29 of Second Chronicles. And you can get it. We're actually not going to read it. You know, not yet. We're going to read a couple of verses from it, but I'm going to tell you the story of it, because uh, Second Chronicles is uh, a book written, we think, by a man called Ezra. And you'll know that Ezra has his own book, see, called Ezra. And he also apparently, they think, smart people think that he wrote Nehemiah as well. He was a scribe, but he was a priest as well. And, and he was a gift, if you like, of God to, to the Israeli nation at the time. But the thing about Ezra is he's a stickler for detail, Right? If you didn't read 2 Chronicles and tried to read 1 Chronicles, the whole six chapters of 1 Chronicles are all about who begat who and who was whose father and who was... It's the most boring section in the Bible. He loves numbers, right? When the Israelites came back to Jerusalem, which they did later on, Ezra wrote down the numbers. And if you look it up, it's quite funny because it says, you know, of the tribe of the Naphtalites, you know, 623 you know, and of the Zebulonites, you know, 142 and a half. It, was, it goes right down to the detail. So if Ezra says something, it's absolutely spot on accurate and it's important. He never, you know, he just covers all the details. He's a, the smart word is a pedant, somebody who looks, you know, into the details. So uh, Ezra wrote Chronicles, we'll assume. So that means that everything he says is, is important to take note of because it's all in there. Whereas, if you're smart and you're reading through Chronicles, you just want to get through it as quick as possible because it's very boring, but it's not. So to avoid that, the talk's called 14 Levites. Ignore the funny little Gangnam-style guy on the side. When I did this in another church, uh, they decided to put, I still have no idea what the heck he's there for. It's like, really? You know? But uh, there he is, and, and that, that's him. So, so anyway... To help you, if you're thinking, all right, that's all right for you, smarty pants, reading through the Old Testament six times and stuff like that. Here's the thing. A long time ago, a very, very smart preacher told me this. He said, when you read through the Old Testament, look for two things, because there's a golden thread and a scarlet thread. 
that's woven right through the whole Bible, right to the beginning, from the beginning right to the end. He says, and that's what you look for. And what he meant by that was the golden thread was about the kingship and the lordship and the greatness of God, right? And King Jesus. He said, the scarlet threads, the bit about sacrifice and sacrifice again. And if you look carefully, you can find that in, in, in the stories you read in the Bible and you understand then what the Bible's telling you. It's telling you there's one coming who will be a king who will give his life and shed his blood as a ransom for many. So anyway, that's the kickoff. Is that all right? And uh, here, here, here comes the story, actually. The story about worship. It's a story written by a man called Ezra, and it's absolutely true. And uh, it goes this way. Since it's a story, it goes, once upon a time. Put the next slide up, please. I'm going to just call the slide. There was an old wicked king, right? And he was astonishingly wicked. His name was Ahaz, actually. And he was only surpassed by one more wicked or king. That was Ahab. That was Ahab and, and uh, what's her name? Jezebel and stuff like that. But Ahaz was really awful. Ahaz cared nothing about the people of Israel. In fact, uh, he, he didn't care anything about anybody except himself. He had no time for God or the temple. No time at all. In fact, in Ahaz's time, because he was so wicked, nobody went to the temple. Uh, the, the, the theologians say that it's probably 50 years that there was no worship or anything in the temple when Ahaz was on the throne. And worse than that, what Ahaz did was he didn't really want to get into trouble with all the people around about because Israel was a bit of a mess at that time. In fact, Israel didn't even exist. It had broken up into two different uh, nations, Israel and Judah. And all the nations around about had sort of overrun Israel, taken them all into captivity. So Israel does not exist at this point. Ahaz was the king of Judah which was a territory of Israel. And uh, things were really quite bad. Young men had been lost in battles and wars, etc. Uh, there was no food for the people to eat. Ahaz didn't care. What he did was try to make as many pacts with as many of the kings around about him as he could. And that involved them giving him little trophies. And he gave him things that, you know, here's one of our idols that we worship. And since we have defeated you in battle, we obviously are more powerful than you. Here's our idol. So Ahaz took those idols and all those little tokens and stuck them in the temple. So much so that you couldn't get the doors open. It's all true. It's in this, this story. You could not get the doors open. So eventually Ahaz died. And that was the best thing that Ahaz ever did in his entire life, actually. <laughs> and a young king, next slide, he came to the throne. And his name was Hezekiah. And you and I had never heard of Hezekiah before this point. Uh, Ahaz, all we know that he was actually one of Ahaz's physical sons. And uh, his, his, his mummy has an interesting name, Azara or something like that. But Hezekiah came to the throne. He was 25 years old. He wasn't the youngest king that ever came to the throne. But he came to the throne. And he came to be the king of Judah. And that sounds quite good, but as I said... Judah was in a complete and total mess. No food, no money, no young men because they'd all been lost in war. They were in serious trouble and uh, there was very little going for Judah. And in actual fact, just to put it in perspective as well, I found this out. Judah was about the size of County Tyrone. Now, you know, with all apologies to anybody who's from that part of the world, if you come in today and said, I am the king of County Tyrone, <laughs> we'd all have a laugh, basically, you know, because it means nothing. So this is, the, this is the reality. So he nothing. He came, and there was nothing to be a ruler over except for three things. Next slide. One, Jerusalem was in Judah, right? And then, as now, Jerusalem was a very important place. In fact, Jerusalem was the city and still is, in a way, the city in the world. It's a place where people, even if they don't like it, even if they hate Jerusalem, they can't not ignore it. So Jerusalem was there. In Jerusalem was a palace. So at least he had somewhere to live. David's palace was still in Jerusalem, still there. Not as nice as that one. I think that's actually Buckingham Palace, but, uh, you know, nearly as good. So he had somewhere to live, and finally, the temple was in Jerusalem. And the historians think that that's why Judah wasn't really taken over at that point. They think that it was because even the heathen nations around knew that there was a temple there. 
And in the Bible, the, the, the other nations used to call it the temple of the great God. He knew there was something about the people, something about the nation. But it was a mess because, as I said, no one had been in the temple for 50 years. There was a bunch of people called Levites who were supposed to be those that worshipped their God. And they hadn't done it at all for 50 years. They hadn't even gone near the place for 50 years. They had great excuses, one of which Ahaz didn't like them because he didn't like God, and he probably would have killed them. So I suppose if we knew this morning that coming to worship might get killed, there might have been less people here, uh, you know. Uh, and, and also, why bother? Because the Levites were supposed to be fed and sustained, if you like, by the other 11 tribes that made up Israel. Well, they didn't exist anymore. They were all gone. They had been taken over by Assyrians and Babylonians and every other nation. So there was nobody bringing anything to the temple. So there was no money for the Levites. And so they thought, well, stuff this. We're a party. We're out of here. Uh, the, 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 the Levites were like that. And sometimes we as worshipers are like that. We, we, you know, when we get a bit disheartened, we say, well, that's it. I'm not doing this anymore. And the Levites were really, really like this. There's a lovely bit in that Ezra writes again about the Israelites coming back to Jerusalem eventually, about 150 years from this point. And when they come back, Ezra writes down the numbers. The smallest tribe that came back to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple was the Levites. Now, how's that for a, a bad record, you know? These were the guys that are supposed to be responsible for the temple, and even when they got a chance to rebuild it, they didn't bother turning up. It sort of reminds you of musicians and worship leaders and stuff like that, doesn't it? You know? And uh, anyway, so here's a young king. Nobody's ever heard of him. And he comes to reign. And I would imagine that he had a whole bunch of advisors. There they are. You see? And so the, the, the minister for finance came and said, right, here's the deal. We have no money. You'll have to sell off your palace. You'll have to sell off some of our land. Could we negotiate it? Get some money in and start buying things to feed the people. You know, the Minister of Agriculture said, right, we're in real trouble here. We haven't been growing anything for ages. We're going to starve. You know, we, we've got to get some sort of a farming process and a, and a policy going so that we can get the thing going. You know, probably the military guy, you know, the Minister for the Defense, he probably said, right, this is it. We haven't got very many young men left, but let's go and attack these people, get some of our land back. All very smart things. And the sort of things we talk about now, even when we're in trouble. We've got to start a building program. You know, build a lot of houses and people will pay for mortgages and, and, and everything will be all right again, you see. But Hezekiah didn't do any of the things that he was asked and advised to do. Not one of them. What Hezekiah did was, next slide, he decided that he would reestablish worship. He actually sought out the worshipers and called them and said, right, do you know what we're going to do to fix our nation Worship. Now, do you know about making a good impression? And they say first impressions are lasting impressions. I mean, I'm hoping I'll make a good impression here today. You know, he, he hopes. My thoughts were when he said this, you know, you sort of think, what? You know, can you imagine David Cameron saying, oh, by the way, we're not going to have a new financial, we're not going to borrow any money from the International Monetary Fund, we're not going to, you know, go to China and see if we can get some sort of a trade deal. What we're going to do is we're all going to worship you would say, you're out of your mind. And my guess is they, they, they probably did think he was out of his mind. Uh, first impressions are good and lasting, actually. Uh, I, when I told this story first, a thought shot into my mind of a long time ago when my wife and my kids and I were on holiday in America. And we were not very well off then. So we were staying in what's called an efficiency. You ever heard of an efficiency? It's like a motel that has a, a kitchen in your, your motel room. And it was a really classy motel. It was one of those ones with steps outside that you went up to an outside sort of corridor and walked along and went into a wee room. And it was pretty grim, but they had breakfast. And my wife, being the lovely woman that she is, decided to get up in one of the mornings and go down along the little sort of concrete walkway, down the steps, and over to the, the main office of the, the hotel, which had a buffet breakfast. And she got a tray. And she brought it all back up the steps, all along, knocked on our door. I was just wakening up, as were the three children. And I opened the door, and there she was. She brought in the tray, set it down. And I noticed that she had forgotten the orange juice. So, so I pointed it out. 
And, and, and she said, maybe you'd like to go and get the orange juice, darling. <laughs> or words to that effect, actually, it was. So I, as, as, as is wise, pulled on my boots. I had boots with me at the time, and I didn't lace them. And I headed out the door quickly, and along the corridor, down the steps, and was going into the foyer of the hotel. This is absolutely true. There were two big, heavy doors, the foyer, see? And I pushed them both open. Now, God has a bad sense of humor, actually, I think. Because I walked through, and these doors closed back behind me, and the right door caught the right boot lace. I swear it's true. And the left door <laughs> caught the left boot lace. And I went to go forward. I just went flat in my face. And all these Americans who are lovely, if you're an American here, you're very welcome. But, they, you know, if I'd been in Belfast, people would just laugh themselves silly. But, of course, they all just looked. And I, in order to get up, had to do this. You know, sink back up. It was not a good impression, all right? So this is sort of the impression, I think, that, that, that Hezekiah said. But here's the thing, all right? What's the deal with this little story? Well, let, let me read a little bit about it, actually, and let you know what's going on here, okay? Next slide. This is the first verse of this. And, you know, th th this is the gold. This is the gold, right? Hezekiah was 25 years old when he became king, and he reigned in Jerusalem 29 years. His mother's name was Abijah, the daughter of Zechariah, not the prophet, another Zechariah. He did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, just as his father David had done. Now, you could read through that and think, oh, here we go. Old Ezra is just getting down into detail. But there's something about that, that, that passage which is very important, right? Uh, it's this. He did what was right in the eyes of the Lord. That was Ezra's way of saying to you and me, this is a good guy. And then he said, just as his father David had done. Right? Well, his father wasn't David. His father was Ahaz. But here Ezra is saying, no, this man was a son of David. And then he says, he, uh, in the first month of the first year, now, that's another Ezra way of saying, here's the first thing he did. You read all his Ezra books, he's always saying, in the first year, first month, first day, etc. He just likes to tell you. The first thing he did, he opened the doors of the temple of the Lord and repaired them. Now, the temple was all jammed up and messed. The doors were wood, and they were covered with gold, and they were on the east side of the temple. And the first thing that Hezekiah, this unknown king, did was he took himself off, and he went to the doors and he repaired them because he knew worship was key to the future and the health of the nation. I can paraphrase this for you and you'll maybe get a sense of what it says. Because here's what it says. There was a king who was a son of David. And he should have been on his throne receiving all the honor and the glory. But he got off the throne. And he picked up the tools of a carpenter. And he went to the house of his father. And he opened the doors. And then he turned to the Levites. You see? See what it says? Where am I? I've lost my way. He brought in the priests and the Levites, assembled them in the square on the east side, and said, listen to me, Levites. So he called the worshipers and said, here's my father's house. Now, there's only one other person in the whole Bible ever did that, and that was Christ himself, son of a carpenter, right? And he should have been on his throne, but he came to earth, he left the throne of God, and he opened the way for you and me to come into the presence of the Father. So I used to go when I was a little boy to Brethren Halls. They call this typological interpretation of the Scripture or foreshadowing. This is a story about Christ. See? And the great thing is, I don't think Ezra has a clue what he's writing, but it's for you and me to see what actually happens. And, and, and what about the scarlet thread? All right. Well, next verse. There you go. Now, this is after Hezekiah has got all the guys together, the priests and the Levites. He's at the temple. He is the king. And then he says this to them. And this is all wrong. This should not be in the Old Testament, right? It's all wrong. It says this. I intend to make a covenant with the Lord, the God of Israel, so that his fierce anger will turn away from us. My sons, do not be negligent now. For the Lord has chosen you to stand before him and serve him, to minister before him and to burn incense. That just sounds pretty much all right, right? But here's the strange thing. You see, a covenant 
is something that you do between one person and another. If you go back to Leviticus, you can read about what a covenant's like. It's really serious, really important. And it, it, it works this way. If I was making a covenant with Andy, I would get an animal, slaughter it, and cut it in two. Right? That's, that's what it says you do. Put one half there, one half there. And he and I would hold hands. That's one way. We're not sure whether you held hands or whether you went and meet, met the person from either end. But we would hold hands and walk through the middle of the two half animals and say this, may this happen to me if I break my word in this covenant. That's how serious it was, you see. But you see, Hezekiah does something strange. He says, I intend to make a covenant for the Lord, with the Lord God of Israel so that his fierce anger will turn away from us. See, he's making a covenant with God on behalf of the people. He said to the Levites, you're the worshipers. I need you to worship. Don't worry, I'll take it if it all goes wrong. Now, only one other person, that's the scarlet thread, did that in the Bible. It's another little story that Ezra wrote in the Bible. And this man was a type of Christ. That's the way we, we, we can understand it. Because Christ came and he made a covenant on behalf of us, the new covenant. He, if you like, was broken in two. He took the punishment. He took the, 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 the guilt and the, the uh, well, the punishment, I suppose. That's the best word. Uh, that was subject to that covenant on our behalf so that we wouldn't have to take that punishment. And so this little story is a Christ story. And in the middle of it is worship. Now, I got to this point in this story. I thought, this is a great story, and I did a whole talk about it. And, but I kept being drawn back to it and drawn back to it and drawn back to it again. I kept thinking, what on earth is uh, wrong with me here? Can't get beyond this point. And it was something that I hadn't realized. Because after this point, Hezekiah sort of says, right, Levi, come on, do this. Don't be negligent. Let's do it. This is what you're called to do. And then in the, the, the Bible, it, uh, it reads like this. Then these Levites arose. And there's a list of Levites that decided to join Hezekiah. And the thing about it is, Ezra wrote this. So he knows who did it. And he writes down the names of the Levites. And 14 men got up. And said, okay, we're with you in this. That's all in the entire nation of Israel. And there's a couple of things about that with, that are interesting. Remember I said that lots of young men had gone to war and had died, obviously, you know, and, and been lost in the battle for the control of all the other tribes of Israel, etc. Well, see, the Levites didn't have to go to war. Levites didn't have to go to war. In fact, they could just, you know, sit around and wait on the the result of the battle, you know, right, okay, that's okay. So the Levites, and so really, in terms of tribes, there had to be more Levites than any other tribe. And in terms of the population of Israel, there was probably thousands upon thousands of them, but only 14. Now that intrigued me, because here's the reality. Those 14 men changed the entire nation of Israel. And you'll see it, because we're going to bounce through some of the, 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 the verses that actually come out of this. And uh, they changed the whole nation of Israel through worship. It was worship that restored Israel. Let's read some of these wee verses. You ready? There you go. Early the next morning, King Hezekiah gathered the city officials together and went up to the temple of the Lord. The 14 Levites went and got some friends, says that. You know, but 14 to start it and got in and cleaned the place out, went to the king and said, all right, we're ready to go. And he went to the city officials. Interesting. I know this is something that, that Andy has in his heart. It's about this city. It's about the people. It's about our politicians honoring them, including them, speaking to them. Hezekiah did that. He says, come on, you see this. We're worshiping in the temple again. And the city officials came. Next wee verse. So the service of the temple of the Lord was reestablished. Hezekiah and all the people rejoiced at what God had brought about for his people because it was done so quickly. I like that. You know, sometimes we think, I don't know about you, I actually 
was at a church and uh, they asked me to share a couple of things for their worship team. And you know what? There were 14 of them in the worship team. I couldn't resist it, you know? And I just thought, here's the thing. You think, you think you're small in number. You think you don't have any influence. You think it's only me. Nobody else cares. This was a nation. And only 14 men said, well, well we'll have a go at that. We'll have a go at, at, at restoring the worship. And it happened quickly, I think, because it was just, well, let's do this. You know, there, was, there was nothing else to it. It was just say, okay, this is what the king wants. Let's do it. Next one. Here you go. A very large crowd of people assembled in Jerusalem to celebrate the festival of unleavened bread. In the second month, they removed the altars in Jerusalem and cleared away the incense altars and threw them into the Kidron Valley. Slowly but surely, but not that slowly, the city began to change. And a huge crowd of people started going to the temple. Why? Because they were worshiping the God of heaven and earth in that place. Because they had reestablished the worship in that place. And it drew the people in. I think there's power in worship. I think, you know, worship is our opportunity to focus our hearts and our minds and our souls and our spirits on giving God the glory. And when he's lifted up, I know he said this about his crucifixion, but when he's lifted up, he draws all men to him. And it certainly drew the population of Jerusalem. Next one, going through them quick. And uh, oh, this is a good one. I like this one. This is, you know, there's stuff in this story. You go, what? Where did that come from? And just out of, the, out of the, the middle of it, what happened was because there wasn't enough priests, proper priests, people were doing things that they shouldn't have been doing. You know, all the laws, you had to be from a certain heritage, you had to be uh, of a certain type, you had to be trained to be a priest and acknowledge and all the rest. Well, there weren't enough of them. There weren't enough Levites to do it. So other people were doing things. And Hezekiah saw this and he thought, oh dear, they're doing the wrong things. We're in trouble. Because the law made it clear that if you did something and you were unclean in the temple, you're pretty much dead. So he prayed. And this is where he prayed. He said this, May the Lord who is good pardon everyone who sets their heart on seeking God. This is a New Testament verse stuck in the middle of the Old Testament. <laughs> the Lord, the God of their ancestors, even if they are not clean. You and I are, are, are not clean. We, 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 you know, we do things wrong, we do things, but here's the thing. If we've set our heart on God, we can make a difference. And this is what he says, according to the rules of the sanctuary, see? They shouldn't really have been able to live after doing what they did, but they did it with a good heart. And the Lord heard Hezekiah and healed his people. There's healing in worship. That's what that verse says. There is healing in worship. It sort of excites me, you know? Do you want to get a big crowd in the church? Worship. That's what it says, you know. Do you want to see healing? Lift up the name of the Lord. Worship the Lord. Next verse. All right. Here you go. The entire assembly of Judah rejoiced. All right. That's the entire nation as it was. All right. Along with the priests and the Levites and all who had assembled from Israel, including, I like this, because the foreigners, this is another, you know, you're not supposed to have foreigners and aliens in the temple. And they were all over it, you see. So uh, not only did the people of Israel say, yeah, but the other people living out in the tribes obviously word got out. And then what was the word? The word was they're worshiping the Lord in Jerusalem. That was all. It wasn't that they've, they've created a great financial package, and if you go there and set up home, it'll be wonderful. No, they were worshiping the Lord in Jerusalem. So uh, including the fo foreigners who had come from Israel and also those who resided in Judah, people from other nations, people who had nothing to do with the Jews and the Hebrews and their religion, they were in the temple worshiping the God of all the heavens and the earth. There was great joy in Jerusalem for since the days of Solomon, son of David, king of Israel, there'd been nothing like this in Jerusalem. See? Worship is restoring this nation. Next one. They brought a great amount. Now, here's a good one. You'll like this. See, they were supposed to bring a tithe. That's why the, the Levites were so ticked off. They'd stopped bringing the tithes. There was no temple that was being, the temple was there, but it wasn't being used. Uh, and, and people weren't paying their, their, their offerings, weren't giving money. In the, so the Levites thought, right, forget this. We'll go to Babylon and open up a nightclub or something like that. That's, you know, that's the sort of thing that, that they reckon that they did, actually, because they were artistic, creative, wonderful people. Uh, but 
when the worship started again, the people started to give. Right? You didn't need the Ministry of Finance to say, let's go out there and get some money from some of our people. This is what happened. They brought a great amount, a tithe of everything. The people of Israel and Judah who lived in the towns of Judah also brought a tithe of their herds and flocks and a tithe of the holy things dedicated to the Lord their God, and they piled them in heaps. They piled them in heaps because the place that they'd set aside as a storehouse was full up. It would be like, you know, one day your stewards are pick, taking up an offering in church here, and they get halfway down, they say, well, I need another basket because this one's full. <laughs> yes, exactly. You know, what a day that would be. But it did. They began, to, in fact, there's a lovely verse in this. It, you, you know, you should read the story. It lasts about three or four chapters. But, uh, you know, Hezekiah goes wandering around the place and finds these mounds of offering and says to the priest, what are these heaps? And uh, the, the priest actually says, look, uh, here's the thing. The people have been giving so much, we don't know where to put it. So we've just piled it all up here. All right? All uh, right. And they, they piled them in heaps. They began doing this in the third month and finished in the seventh month. There's a good offering time. Four months of offerings in exchange. Great. When Hezekiah and his officials came and saw the heaps, they praised the Lord and blessed the people of Israel. And there's the bit in the bottom there. Can I go up at all? Uh, where is it? Yeah, Hezekiah asked the priests and Levites about the heaps. And Azariah, the chief priest, since the people began to bring their contribution to the temple of the Lord, we have had enough to eat and plenty to spare because the Lord has blessed his people this great amount is left over. And maybe you're thinking, yeah, okay. Listen, you know, that's a, you're, it's a long shot there. But look, th- this story is very simple. The country, the temple, the nation was in turmoil. It was useless, worthless. It was about to be wiped out by stronger nations. And the king said, let's worship our God. That's all. And out of that came all these things. One more, I think, I think, Oh, no, it's not. There's, uh, 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 I mustn't have put it up. There's a, there's a lovely bit in it, um, because in, in case you're into welfare, social welfare and stuff like that, there's, there's, a, there's a bit in it where they actually reestablish support for widows and orphans, right? All out of worship. All these things have come out of worship. And so what, is, what does this mean? I'm nearly finished, actually. So that's, that's good. What, what does, it, does it mean? Does it mean you go around singing wee choruses everywhere you go, you know? Well, not unless you want to be put away for a very long time, I think, you know. But maybe, maybe. What it actually means is just, I think, reminding yourself again that your life, what you do, your family, uh, your job, everything can be an offering of worship to the Lord. And and I know it's hard sometimes to understand. I remember as a a young boy... um, you know, the, the, you know, I would go to some meetings and people would say, you know, you can worship the Lord washing the dishes. No, you cannot. I hate washing dishes. I, 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 could, I couldn't figure that one out for a long time. Then, then when I got married, someone got us a dishwasher and I thought, hallelujah, there you go. I can press the button. Praise God. You know, it's our lifestyle. It's our song. It's our heart. It's almost saying, hey, Lord, you know what we need. You've done it all, you know. We want to give everything to you. We want to give everything that we do to you. We want to cover everything that we do in our churches and in our homes with worship. We want to live lives that are sacrificially laid down, as uh, Paul said in the New Testament, our, our acceptable worship, the sacrifice of our lives, laying them down and saying, Lord, you did this for us. I fully believe, do you know what I did, actually? I actually went and bought... Uh, 14levites.com. I haven't done anything with it. I just went and bought it. I thought, there's something about this. There's something about it. If you go through the Bible and you get stuck at something, God's trying to say something. And I, I really do believe that what God's saying is, hey, look, you know, the, the key to all these things coming together is if you worship me and lift up my name in your homes, in your businesses, in your church. And uh, I think we'll be amazed at what God can do. Amen.